Okay, there's two points that I think to apply. Uh, one is expresses my fear that if we get up uh, to too many parts per million, uh, that uh, we, it's conceivable we could really be in dangerous territory. And then there's this quote of which there's many other variants that climate change is the biggest market failure the world has ever seen. So this is a tremendous problem, as we all know, getting sovereign nations to agree uh, on solving a public goods problem. Now, um, I'm a little bit humbled here because I believe that I probably know less about uh, practical aspects of international climate negotiations and even the history of it than at least half the people here. Uh, but basically, we all sort of know what happened uh, uh, in Kyoto in the aftermath. Uh, there was some sense or some spirit I would interpret that the advanced uh, developed countries would show good faith by cutting back on emissions at uh, binding quote unquote levels that weren't actually binding of about 5% relative to 1990 they would achieve in the period around 2012. And then I think the hope was that uh, uh, developed countries would go further in uh, cutting back and the underdeveloped countries would join in. There was also some hope of varying degrees as I was reading that the caps might be converted uh, into cap and trade, although that was always an economists' uh, desire. Well, th there are various interpretations, but I think the approach failed or certainly wasn't fully successful. The U.S. didn't ratify, others dropped out. And the developing countries are not joining now in continuing this in some sort of quote unquote binding uh, agreement. So the current situation is not fully satisfactory. We've, it seems as if we've sort of given up on a comprehensive top down approach and this emphasis on bottom up regional altruism I would call it, it doesn't address head on the externality problem. And I want to go back and try to address head on uh, the externality problem and uh, talk about or think about conceptually uh, a, different, uh, a different approach centered more on prices. So who is the audience for this? I, I don't know. It's some futuristic uh, version of us where uh, for one reason or another, maybe the international community gets together and I want to sort of perhaps help to lay some groundwork by saying that a core difficulty, I think, and I'll try to make this case, was negotiating one, pr was that we tried to negotiate in quantities. Uh, if we tried to think in terms of and negotiate one price, I think it would have been better, and I think it has desirable characteristics. So that's what I'm going to argue, that a core difficulty, and I'll talk about it anyway, is that uh, we, which we try to uh, tackle in quantities. Um, now, well, let me say clearly, maybe I'll say it again, it's difficult, I should have put it up there uh, as part of the, uh, my points. It's difficult to get countries to agree to anything. So that's a core problem here with what I'm presenting, and it's a core problem with any approach to try to get international coordination. It's difficult to get countries to agree to anything on climate change, but the point is I'm gonna try to make I think it's I think that negotiating one price is relatively easier than negotiating in quantities. So let me, let's go back uh, to basics. I'm going to try to say here that there are three desirable properties for a negotiating instrument uh, to induce cost effectiveness, uh, to be of low, and this I feel awkward with because it's intuitive uh, or heuristic or behavioral maybe, depending on how you want to call it. It should be of low and hopefully one dimension centered on some natural focal point. You could try to, I think, uh, uh, use the names of Coase and Schelling to try to back up this, this point. And the third point, which I think 
is an insight here of some sort. It's not, uh, it's not profound for sure. Is that the nego but, but I think it is, this is a very important characteristic. The negotiating instrument should embody what I'm calling countervailing force by giving an incentive to internalize the externality. And quantities in different caps, uh, with or without the, tra the tradable permit part, uh, at best satisfy one of, uh, point one, inducing cost effectiveness. They, they don't embody countervailing force. Every country wants a low cap. They want it as low, in their narrow self-interest, they want the cap as low as possible. I don't think countries a actually have been acting fully in their own uh, narrow self-interest. The EU, for example, has gone beyond what it would do on the basis of just a purely selfish calculation. But it's not, doesn't seem like it's nearly far enough to, uh, to uh, throughout the world, to internalize the externality. So caps uh, don't have this third property, and they don't have the second property either, because they're not centered on, on one focal point. Now let's consider, sort of as a thought experiment, the binding agreement to adhere to a uniform minimum carbon price, which is then negotiated among countries. Again, it's a critical issue. How do you get them? How do you arm twist them? What series of perceived catastrophes linked to climate change would cause there to be an atmosphere of more international agreement and more recognition that countries don't have the autonomous right to pollute the commons with, with CO2? Um, so the idea is each country gets to keep the proceeds. So it's like they're taxing themselves, so they're putting a price on uh, carbon, and they it is important to keep the proceeds. So it's a thought experiment. You, everyone's forced to come up with a, an agreement on a uniform carbon price applicable to all the parties at once. Now, this does embody a countervailing force because what I want in my own narrow self-interest for myself is a low is to penalize myself with a low price. It's true I collect I collect it as a tax, but I want it low because then it's not going to uh, cause me to uh, uh, have to uh, produce uh, products by more expensive carbon-free alternatives. So I want this low price for myself, but if I vote for or negotiate for a low price, understanding it is going to be one uniform price, I'm also partly shooting myself in the foot because that low price will cause other countries to, uh, to uh, emit a lot more carbon dioxide. So the one price if we're negotiating one price has uh, a countervailing force. And the, the, the paper, you can go further analytically. I'm not doing it here in this presentation. But you can give a formal sense in which this internalization occurs. Uh, what happens is that uh, you, instead of, uh, as with, with strict voluntarism, marginal cost equals the narrow marginal benefit from my emitting one less unit or charging myself an internal price, there's a multiplier that applies to the marginal benefit. So I'm setting my own marginal cost equal to my own narrow marginal benefit, but multiplied up by some big multiplier that takes account of the fact that the rest of the world will also be lowering its carbon emissions. You can do that, and with some more structure uh, imposed, uh, I can get a kind of a majority voting result, a sort of a median voter result, that um, with more structure put on, there is a rigorous, given the, uh, given the model and given the level of abstraction, there's a rigorous result that um, the majority voting result will obtain that the median marginal benefit is equal to the marginal cost instead of what you need for the uh, Lindahl Samuelson condition, which here is that the average marginal benefit uh, equal uh, each party's marginal cost. So you can get with voting, with an 
an imaginary voting system with an imaginary world climate assembly or something like uh, something uh, imaginary uh, uh, like that, you you will get as close to a uh, satisfying the Samuelson condition as the median of marginal benefits is close to the average of marginal benefits. So uh, there's some structure here that's going to support this notion uh, that uh, of um, uh, helping to internalize the global warming externality. Now, uh, let, me, let me conclude on this and leave time for discussion. Uh, perhaps, uh, uh, perhaps this argument in favor of prices is, uh, you notice I've, I've gone, out, I've steered clear of traditional arguments of taxes versus, uh, uh, versus caps. Uh, I'm trying to focus on this pr particular argument, which is relatively new. Um, maybe I'm being unfair to cap and trade, because suppose that we uh, uh, s suppose that, uh, for example, everyone agreed in a preliminary way, every country agreed on what the reduction coefficients would be, and instead they vote or negotiate on the overall level. Right? Then you would have a focal point, the overall level that you vote and negotiate on, and this too would internalize the externality to some extent, because given these, uh, uh, these various uh, proportional reductions or sharing coefficients, um, the, I wouldn't vote to have the lowest possible um, emissions, because although that would help me, it's going to cause the whole rest of it's going to cause the total emissions throughout the world uh, to be too low. However, with this scheme, you'd have this, the same or a very similar free riding problem of the stage one, where you're assigning or negotiating these N uh, reduction coefficients. So it, it seems like it still, it doesn't get rid of the one versus N uh, a problem. It sort of puts it back a stage. Now, one thing I want to point out is that uh, why, am, why are we getting these differences between uh, caps and, uh, and, uh, and prices or internal taxes? I think, for me anyway, I got accustomed to thinking that there's a symmetry between cap and trade and taxes or prices, because within one country there is a symmetry. Leave the uncertainty aside, uh, basically uh, uh, a total quantity that's being assigned induces a price, and you could use the price as a tax. Uh, but there's a difference when there's, when there's one country that's assigning, uh, it, the country is assigning the total N quantities. When there's different countries, they have to negotiate the N quantities. So the assigning N quantities versus assigning one price has a certain symmetry within a country, an overall arching governance structure, but when these things themselves have to be negotiated, I think it breaks this symmetry and argues in favor of the, uh, of the one price. So the, uh, uh, my tentative conclusion is that there's a story here in some theory, and negotiating one price uh, in this spirit or this sense is superior to, to, looks like it's superior to negotiating in quantities. Um, maybe we kind of got off on the wrong foot by making Kyoto and our whole approach to uh, uh, carbon dioxide mitigation uh, quantity based. Maybe that was flawed or it was getting off on the wrong foot. Um, so uh, uh, I f if, the, if the opportunity comes up if, in, in the future, um, I think these kinds of reasons argue more in favor of thinking in terms of, dialoguing in terms of a minimal price uh, on carbon dioxide uh, emissions as opposed to uh, an assignment of quantities to different countries. Thank you. Thank you.